Good, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Emma, you're getting paid for it, so that's okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. All right, so, uh, oh, yeah, I made that. Sorry about that. So my name is Raul Honda, like the footballer. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I didn't carry my business cards because I thought it made more sense to come here in person. And, Kate, I have a couple of questions for you. I was looking for you yesterday, but I couldn't find you, so uh, I'd like to speak to you later. Um, so I'm going to talk about myself for a couple of minutes because I'm going to sell myself first so that you listen to me and then talk about um, data-driven marketing, the past, the present, the future, um, and then a little bit about what I do. So we had a panel session yesterday, people over profit. I get paid to do that. So I'm the chief operating officer at Fuel Intelligence. Um, we're into video metrics. And we tell companies, marketers, what you need to tell your agency to do. In which direction should your agency go to, right? I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about um, inputs, understanding what your client wants. We tell the client what they want. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Fuel Intelligence. Um, I've been working with people, for people, and by the people for the last 20 years. Um, I'm still young at heart. Yeah, no, no one else is young at heart? No? Yes? Yes? Okay. All right. So um, I'm a firm believer of the fact that uh, we should put people over profit. Um, I work with medical marketing operations, I'm currently working with one of the top 10 tech market research companies in the US. They're solely into consumer packed goods. And I'm here to talk about data because there's so many people today who said data is this and data is that. And, and you know, we spoke about AI and um, we spoke about why sales hates marketing. I've done that, been there, done that, you know? Changing the leads from on Zoho from somebody else's name to my name. Um, done sales, marketing, learning and development, operations. I've been around people for a very long period of my time. So I think that was about me. Um, before we look into getting the balance right, and the future of data-driven marketing, I wanted to talk about three very important things that I paid someone <laughs> to learn from um, is the golden circle. Um, the golden circle talks about three things, the how, the what, and the why. And the how, the what, and the why, these three things apply everywhere. Right? It applies everywhere. I'm, I've not put it on the presentation because I'm standing in front of you talking about it. So we all know why, we all know how marketing is done. We all know what it does. But do we know why we do it? I mean, all of you guys are so passionate about what you do. I've seen people network, uh, you know, I've seen people interact, I've seen people ask questions, I've seen uh, budding entrepreneurs asking a lot of questions, right? And it takes a lot of courage to lead that nine to five, paycheck to paycheck job, like Noha did there, and uh, you know, and and start something of your own. And in my personal and professional career, I've always asked this question to myself: Why? Right? And that's what fuel intelligence solves. That's what our mother company, Nailbiter, which is, like which I said, one of the top 10 uh, tech CPG companies in the world solves, is we tell why you should market, why you should market in a certain way. Why is your guy buying, you know, if Pepsi was my client, why is Pepsi buying Pepsi and not buying Coca-Cola? They're both going to give you diabetes, right? They're, gonna, they're both going to make you fat. But why is that happening? Why is that so important? 
So I think uh, a key takeaway for my learning in that three-day program was the golden circle, which talked about asking why. Why are people important over profit, right? Why are we all here today? And I think that gives you a very different perspective about life, a perspective that people pay to learn. We had a lot of life coaches. We had uh, business coaches here. And I'm sure they'll tell you, look inside yourself and ask, why are you doing this? Does it make you happy? Is this what you want to do in life? Right? And I think with everything that, we've, that I've learned in the last two days about artificial intelligence, human intelligence, people agreeing, disagreeing, talking about uh, how to be an effective marketer, a lot of digital marketing agencies, um, you know, people who own digital marketing agencies have come and said, and I think if you ask your clients why, that should answer your question, right? So we'll start with, finally, <laughs> the presentation. So I will take 10 minutes to go through this because you're very intelligent, intellectual people, and I don't want to bore you with stuff that you already know about who doesn't like standing here and talking, right? <laughs> so I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so we're going to talk about what is data-driven marketing, duh. And then we're talk going to talk about data-driven marketing, the business case. Oh, there was one here. I didn't know that. And then how beneficial is a data-driven marketing approach, the history, the past, the present, and the future of data-driven marketing, right? So let's talk about what is data-driven marketing. Everybody knows that, that on an average, I get 30 emails a day. And I'm a C-level executive, and I don't share my email with anyone. One of the reasons I didn't carry my business card. <laughs> but I still get tons of emails from people, God knows from where. I have no clue. Like, the government of India reminds me that my insurance is going to expire. It tells me two weeks in advance that my insurance is going to expire in two weeks. And if you end up hitting somebody, you're not going to get your, you know, your car fixed. That is data-driven marketing for you, right? Like Sephora, every, every time I have my marriage anniversary and I've forgotten for how long I've been married, I've been married for a very long time, my wife is watching, um, and it reminds my wife, oh, look, it's your anniversary. Get your husband to Sephora. Let's empty his pockets. You know? And the fun thing is that we're based out of Mumbai, right? And the Sephora in Dubai will send an email to my wife even before the Sephora in India. That is data-driven marketing. We've all done that. But like we spoke of, like... Kate said, right, timing is very important. Timing is of essence, it's of key. If Sephora sends an email to my wife after the anniversary and I've forgotten it, yeah, that's, that's not going to be good, right? So since I've put in some stuff there, I'm going to read it, okay? Um, Data-driven marketing refers to the method methodology of extracting actionable insights tied to consumer behavior from large data sets. Like I said, out of all the people in the world, they chose to email my wife. They didn't email me, they emailed my wife, right? So when I was thieving through information, when I was looking at a lot of stuff that, you know, for this, for this presentation, because I told them I don't want a presentation, I just want to talk, I get paid to do this all the time, right? And they said, no, you have to have a presentation. So I was looking at this, and I said, oh my god, I'm looking at the data, and it says 64% of executives strongly agree. Who cares? We all know data work. We all know that data-driven marketing is the future. But what I'm going to talk about is the struggle. The struggle that COVID, Delta, Beta, Omicron, Decacron, I don't know. Like, it's, like, it's like, you know, um, what the kind of impact that COVID has had, right, is something that I'm going to talk about and why the future of data-driven marketing is 
precision data-driven marketing. You need to be relevant. I'm a firm believer of the fact that change is the only thing and the only goddamn thing that's constant. If I'm not going to evolve, I will be made redundant. Do you guys agree? Only the women here agree. Do you guys agree? No? Maybe? Let me give you an example, right? I have a 10-year-old daughter, and uh, I come home, and she wants me to be goofy, right? She tells me, you know what? Dance with me on this song called Dance Monkey. And I tell her I'm really old, you know, and like, I take care of 400 people at work. And she says, I don't care. You have to dance. And I have to dance. I, as an individual, have to, I cannot have the same kind of behavior that I have at work with my 10-year-old daughter. I can tell her, here's your target. Go meet it. <laughs> I can't do that. So I'll ask the question again. Do you believe that change is the only thing that's constant? Right? Okay. I have some consensus. So I'm sure you guys have looked at this. What these tell you is that what I'm saying is right. That's what this says. Okay? And we'll talk about the benefits. I've made some notes. I hope I'm able to understand my own handwriting. So... Uh, it's obvious that we are all, all here to increase our ROI, right, for ourselves, for our clients, for our people, and it's proven that data-driven marketing increases ROI, or else they wouldn't have this keynote speech here today, right? Okay? Um, and op it's obvious we know that traditional marketing is twofold, and then we have a couple of very, very important uh, benefits here. It gives you time and clarity. You're able to segmentate better. It helps you personalize, which we'll talk about more in detail. It helps you improve your CX, your customer experience. It helps you in product development. We'll talk more about that later as well. And you can use that data across multiple channels. Now, let me pause here and tell you a little bit about what we do. If I were to tell you that out of 5,000 people that went to a Target store to get whatever groceries they had to, how many people noticed Diet Coke? Out of the people who noticed Diet Coke, how many picked it up? Out of the people who picked it up, how many turned that bottle over to look at how healthy this is going to make me. And if I were to tell you the reason that that individual decided to go ahead and buy that product, that's what we do. That's what we do. We work with 15 of the top 20 FMCG companies in the US. We work with Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, Record Bennett, um, Valvoline, Hymax, um, a lot of these people that we work with, uh, this segment of video metrics is very niche. We're the only ones who are doing it effectively. And we've been doing it for the last six years. A lot of you people said, video is the next thing. I had a colleague here from, uh, from Bangladesh who said, video is the next thing, AI is the next thing. We knew video was the next thing because our founders, and I am a firm believer of the fact that video is the largest source of untapped data. It is. It is the largest source of untapped data. I can tell you that from a three minute video, I can give you 400 data points that a three minute survey cannot. I can tell you that when the guy entered, did he go to your aisle first? Did he check out the girl next to him first? I can tell you that. I can tell you, did he find the Diet Coke himself or somebody had to help him? I can tell you that if 100 people noticed your Diet Coke, how many picked it up? How many actually bought it? 
And if they bought it, why did they buy it? And if they didn't buy it, why did they not buy it? So what we do is the prequel of data marketing. We tell you where you should tell your digital agency to focus on. That's what we do, right? And which is why I chose this keynote speech, because I live, breathe, digest data day in and day out. I want to spend two minutes to talk about AI versus human intelligence, if I may. So I'm sure many of you know Snapchat, TikTok, um, YouTube, YouTube Shorts. Snapchat alone employs 90,000 people across the world, both first party and third party. People on their payroll, and they've outsourced it to, of course, India, um, to do content moderation. That means they have a very capable AI system that helps them detect, you know, hate speech, uh, nudity, whatever uh, policies they have where you can post something on Snapchat or TikTok. And 60% of the times, AI works. 40% of the times, it does not work. And that's why you have 90,000 people across the world sitting and moderating content. Sitting and, tell, and looking and saying, oh, you know what? This needs to be flagged. Oh, you know what? This is what needs to be flagged. You may have had so many instances where you, you, know, you take a video on Instagram for more than 15 seconds, and let's say there's some music playing in the background. If it's more than 15 seconds, Instagram will say that you're violating um, copyright because you didn't pay the guy whose music you know, is in your video. Now that's done through AI, but that only happens six out of 10 times. So I, I'm, I believe the fact that AI is here to stay, and I believe uh, the lady who gave me an example about Korea, if somebody told me that would you like to get toothpaste, I tell them deliver it, right? But at the same time, if somebody were to gauge my mood, I'd freak out, I'd freak out, right? Because my wife cannot gauge my mood. <laughs> I've been with her for a very long time, and I can't gauge her mood, right? So um, that's you know, one thing that I wanted to talk about. The next thing that we'll talk about is the history of data-driven marketing, because, because it's there. So we'll talk about it. Um, so it started with CRMs. I think Alpha spoke about Zoho. Uh, we spoke about Salesforce. Salesforce started in the 2000s. Used Salesforce for a very long time, not for billing and accounting and delivery, but for lead generation for sales. And we use Salesforce as well. So to give you guys an overview of our journey, let's say, right, Kat is someone who loves shopping. And I'm sorry I'm giving you an example because you're sitting right here. I, mean, I know you're going to regret it, but OK. So um, let's say Kat is an avid shopper, right? And I want to know how's her shopping journey, right? So, but she's not going to do it for free. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, I only have six minutes left. Oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and tell Kat that, look, why don't you go to Target, make a video, on our app, right, through your entire shopper journey, and go ahead and tell me how it felt. Now that video comes to us, we analyze data and pass it on. But how do we manage CAT? So in our terms, she's called a panelist. In market research, you need to have a panel that you need to fill. She's called a panelist. And we do our digital marketing to generate and get more panelists. So we have referral programs. We have um, you know, um, invitations that we give out where people are told that you know, if you qualify for a specific task that's given to you on our app, you get reward points or Amazon vouchers and whatever. And who doesn't love an Amazon voucher, right? So that's how CRM comes into the picture. So we are at both ends of it. We do digital marketing ourselves. 
uh, to get more panelists like Kat on board who can make videos for us across the US, Europe, um, Asia Pacific, all of it. I'm gonna wrap up because I only have five minutes and I'll see Emma's head popping up any moment now. So um, CRMs are more significant today. We all know that, right? Salesforce is the thing. You've got Zoho outside, that's the thing. It's more significant today is because it's getting the work done. It's because it helps you manage what you do a lot more easier and in a much better way. So if you'd like to read through all the gibber that I've written, I will send you a copy of the, of the presentation, but I only, and I can see Emma's head right there, so. Okay, so the future of data-driven marketing is personalization, but to an extent where it's not creepy, right? It's not creepy. And how do you define that line? I think intelligent marketers would be able to identify that line of what's okay versus where you're invading someone's privacy. Do you agree? I mean, you guys are, would be very thoughtful before sharing your information with anybody, correct? You're very, very thoughtful about it. If I came up to you and you didn't know that I could talk and you didn't know if I was a part of this conference, if I came up to you, you wouldn't give me your information. You wouldn't tell me the hell what your name is. You wouldn't. So how can you expect somebody on the other side, right, where an exit pop-up comes up, how can you expect him to put in that information until and unless he does not feel that you know him? And I'm going to circle back to what Lady Didi Wong said. It's not who you know, it's whether they know you or not. And I think that applies to marketing as well. Because if you look at it from the way I'm looking at it, right? Content creators, TikTokers, 14-year-olds wearing very expensive shoes. Very, very expensive shoes. And people know about those shoes because of those 14-year-olds, right? I mean, I know about those shoes because I love them. I love shoes, right? And, but those people know about it is because of a 14-year-old TikToker who's wearing those shoes somersaulting in the air, tying himself upside down, and that's what works, right? So it's not only personalization where Sephora sent an email to my wife saying, hey, it's your anniversary, rip your husband off, <laughs> right? Or, you know, it's my birthday, or it's my daughter's birthday. We've been there, it's been happening for so many years, right? Hamleys come up with every year when it's my daughter's birthday, they invite her for a surprise birthday party in a place like Bombay, where all the kids get you know, to participate in her birthday, that's the next level of personalization. And I think that's where we should go. And when we, as an organization, as my company, what we do is we give, we, Kate's entire experience is her personal experience, right? So if I'm gonna get a thousand people like Kate to give out information where she's made a video, I can analyze and personalize and tell my client to personalize their digital marketing, their outdoor marketing, their, you know, communication marketing, whatever it is that they want to do in a much better way. Do you agree? Yes? No? Maybe? Just get over with it. What's going on in your mind? Right? Right? So, now we talked about AI, so I'm going to skip this slide. And, yep. So I'm going to talk about this briefly. Uh, and I'm going to use the notes that I made for it. So we talk about being creative. You've got creative agencies. You've got media agencies. And then you've got agencies that source that data for you. But I think if I were Coca-Cola, and because I worked with, with Coca-Cola, with Pepsi, with P&G, with Johnson & Johnson, with Reckitt Bennett, I think what they're looking for is a merger of all three things. They're looking for you to be creative, push it across all possible media, using relevant data. 
Now, the challenge that we've had post-COVID is, let me tell you some stats that we had. So between March and August 2020, one in five consumers switched brands. Now, there could be various reasons, right? It was out of stock or it was the cheapest thing to do or whatever. But one in five consumers, four in five, one in five consumers switched brands, and seven in 10 tried new digital channels. So now the biggest problem with the biggest problem with data-driven marketing or the biggest challenge with data-driven marketing is relevance. Every digital agency here is trying to be relevant. That's why you're evolving, right? Every digital agency here wants to do something new. Everybody spoke about, people spoke about it yesterday. You spoke about it, that there are new things that individuals have to do because clients' expectations are increasing. Similarly, your people, your users, their behavior is changing every day. Every day. My daughter likes BTS today. She'll probably like somebody else tomorrow, right? The reason BTS is still relevant, and I think they're, they're the best marketed brand in the world, so is uh, the prime minister of our country. He's a marketer himself. He's been able to market himself globally, which is why he's still here. Because every time something happened, he made himself relevant. So the future of data-driven marketing is precision data-driven marketing. That means that the data that you get today will be irrelevant in two weeks. And I can say that, I know many may not agree, but I can say that is because we track consumer habit every week. The same guy who bought A product last week decides to buy B product. He was offline last week. That means he went to a store and got it. This week he wants it online. You could call it accessibility. You could call it people being lazy. You could call it people having a lot of options. But if you look at it, it's all about having relevant data. BTS has their own app. They've got their own Twitter. They've got their own stuff. And every day, they make sure that they're in the game. They're relevant. My sister-in-law is old. She's about 40 years old. And she went to a theater here in Dubai where they screened the BTS concert. And that's like the fourth concert. And then the next day she went, she watched it on TV at home because they're making themselves relevant. And that's the importance of having relevant data. Now, if you talk about a boy band that's in its 30s, that's in its 20s, do you think it would appeal to a 40-year-old woman? No, it wouldn't. No one would think of it. But it does. And that's why BTS is here. Because they've made themselves relevant with a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 40-year-old. That is why the prime minister of our country is still the prime minister of our country. Right? It's because everybody is a good, everybody wants and everybody needs to make sure that they are relevant. We're all here today to be relevant. This award this felicitation, this speech, which I'm going to post 15,000 times over the next two years online, is to make myself feel relevant. And that's what we need. That's the future of data-driven marketing. Is Emma out of her box? Yes, she is. OK. All right. So I, had, I don't think I had anything else to cover. But thank you very much for being so patient. And I'll just skip to the last slide. Okay, so Emma, thank you for being such, in lo uh, such a lovely MC. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Very quick, though, because we are really over time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, so did, it, I thought it was it, going no, minus, and it would it's tell gonna, me. It's going to be a choice whether you guys want a coffee break or we just crack on. No, no, I, because I, I we need a coffee break. I'm sure time. they need a coffee break. Yeah. I will be quick. Don't worry. Um, we, we speak a lot about future of marketing we talk about about data driven marketing um i would like to hear your insights on we speak about future of data driven marketing what is your thought on the impact of ios 14 which has impacted a lot of advertisers uh, you have rightfully mentioned everybody has the right to share data now 
uh, that's one thing. Um, it will only impact further. And the secondly is, of course, there has been a lot of talks about cookie-less world and you know, uh, uh, also following up on the previous panel as well. There are a lot of our work that are surrounding data. But when we move into that cookie world when we can't track anything, a lot of the effort doesn't matter anymore. Correct. Right, so I, I would like to hear your, your insights. Okay, great question. I was actually speaking to Atish about it. I don't know if he's still here. We were talking about the exact same thing about getting relevant data becoming challenging because companies want clean data. They, want, they don't want to get sued, especially in the US. And with iOS 14 coming in, which is going to ask you every time somebody wants to peep into your phone or put those cookies, God knows where they put them, right? Um, I believe and I think that the only way to go about it, like for example, when we let our people make those videos, we're very clear in our communication to them. And when we very clearly tell them, this is what we're gonna do with our data. I think the biggest problem here is fear, right? There's no clarity about where my data is gonna go. But if you were to tell me, and this is my personal opinion, right? If you were to tell me that I'm gonna use your data in this fashion, over here, I'm not gonna freak you out, right? If you're shopping for toys, and I realize that you're shopping for toys, I will give you recommendations on toys. I think that's where we need to go to, because to be honest with you, with what's gonna happen with iOS 14 and what's gonna get there at some point in time, and then we're gonna be in this infinite loop where people are struggling for quality data, for opt-in data. To give you one example, and we can of course discuss it further, durable medical equipment is one of the largest Medicare costs in the US. Everybody knows Medicare in the US, You've got, you get insurance, right? You cannot go ahead and pitch someone that, Kat, do you have pain in your knees? She's gonna regret sitting here. Do you have pain in your knees? I can give you braces. Until and unless she opts in and tells you that yes, I've got pain in my knees. To give you another example, when we, if I were to tell you to make a video, I would tell you exactly how many people are gonna watch it, what process it's gonna go through, and how am I gonna use your data. I will even tell you that I will use your data with Coca-Cola and its competitor, Pepsi. And I think clarity and clear communication is the only way in which we can get the right kind of data. Because to be honest, we're in this situation today is because people don't know how their data is being used, right? If I came to you and I asked you for your business card and I told you that, give me your business card, I'm gonna send you a LinkedIn invitation, I'm gonna send you an email and we'll take it further, you'd be more comfortable, wouldn't you? And that is what I, like I said, it's my personal belief. Uh, people may agree to disagree, but my personal belief is communicating and which is why people talked about opt-in data but I think in the future, getting or letting people know about whether their privacy is actually being violated by sending information to people who shouldn't have be having it, or is she standing behind waving at me? Yes, okay. Oh, I'll I need, I need, I really need you to wrap up, Ralph. Okay, please. all right, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I told you I get paid to do this. You're going to regret it. But, <laughs> But yeah, so that's what it is. And I think, like I said, we could take this discussion further. I've got a lot of things to talk about, obviously. Uh, but I know Emma's struggling. So thank you very much for being so patient and kind. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you so much.